friends, 2021 is in the rear view mirror. On this journey of life, it's behind us, and now we are in 2022. It's what lays out on the horizon in front of us. Have you thought about how you're intending to journey through 2022? Again, with the turning of the calendar, often it's a time for self-reflection. It's a time for perhaps setting some new goals, some New Year's resolutions. And, and maybe even just to say, I hope to get through one more day. Have you thought about how you're going to approach it? Maybe, maybe some have thought about a particular pair of pants that they can't wait to get back into. That's the goal. They want to get back into a particular pair of pants. Maybe some have a reading goal. They're like, I want to read 10 books this year or 50 books this year. Uh, whatever it may be. Some of you may say, I want to walk more. I'm going to spend some time in the neighborhood. I'm going to get outside. I'm going to be more active. Others... Maybe you have goals around rest and a healthier pace of life. Sabbath, breaks, recognizing that in 2022, just like every other year, you were not made to simply produce. But as humans, we get to rest. All of these are good things. But friends, underneath, lying underneath all of those maybe goals and aspirations and intentions for 2022, I want to invite you to lean into recommitting to taking a fresh look at what Jesus is calling us into this year. Take a fresh look at it. Because for many, you've committed to following Jesus. You've set out on the path. And uh, in 2022, again, the encouragement, the invitation is to join me in taking a fresh look at what that may mean for today in our households, in our places of work, in our neighborhoods, in our country, and in our world. What is Jesus inviting us into? As we think about 2022, friends, the reality is that challenges from 2021 do not magically disappear. Sorry, COVID's not gone. The family tensions you had a couple days ago are still here. Those uh, issues, those maybe sin issues that you've been navigating, yep, still ensnared by them. The challenges don't magically disappear, but friends, here's also the reality. That God's mercy is new every morning. And therefore, this new mercy is present and enough to meet every old challenge. God's mercy is new every morning. And it's this merciful God who, from the beginning we see in the scriptures, has pursued humanity. Has pursued humanity and even took on flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. And he pursued us, this merciful God. And who in Jesus continues to be active, redeeming and reconciling the whole world. The entire thing. Now, when we say redeeming and reconciling, those aren't words that we use in our common language day in and day out in 2022. But friends, so this idea of redeeming, if we trace it back in the ancient world, slavery was a reality. And the thought of redeeming, you redeemed a slave by going and paying the price and being able to set that slave free. And so this image of redeeming is that Jesus has redeemed us humanity, the world, from slavery to sin and death. And so Jesus has redeemed and is redeeming, right? It's now, but it's also not yet, and it's in process, and it's active. So, and he's reconciled. Again, a word that we may not use unless maybe you're an accountant, and you're reconciling the books, right? You're uh, making sure that the numbers line up, making sure that the math is right, accurate. Reconciling is also about, again, bringing order to the chaos, bringing harmony to the dissonance. And so, friends, in God's mercy, through Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit, God is actively redeeming and reconciling the world. And, friends, in God's rich mercy, he actually invites us to participate in that action. Invites us to participate in the redeeming, in the reconciling, to be active in it. He's inviting us 
to follow Jesus as Jesus sets about to be active in the world. Now, when we see Jesus, Jesus has been in the business of inviting people to follow him. From the very beginning of his ministry, we see Jesus participate in this invitation. Invitation. Now, friends, if you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to turn to Matthew chapter 4. And we just want to take a quick look at Jesus calling his first disciples, inviting them to join him in what he was up to. Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 and following, and here's how it goes. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father, Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. Now, friends, let's just set the stage for a moment. When Jesus meets these young men, their identity was sure. The Bible says it's very clear. They were fishermen, right? They were fishermen. Verse 18. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. What they did defined who they were. And so when we think about that, they, that was a core to their identity. But we see that they were also, these guys were also part, they, they had a belonging. You see, in Bethsaida, it was a small town, probably eight to ten families that made up this. So there were close bonds as people navigated life together, helping each other out. The relationships would have been tight. So they had a sense of belonging. They were some of the fishermen that provided food for that town, produce to trade and provide for their families. They had identity. They had belonging. And they had purpose. Each day they got up. They knew what they were about to do. They went out on the boats, casting their nets into the lake, bringing in fish. At the end of the day, getting home sweaty, smelling like uh, seafood. They could go home and they could know, I put in a hard, hard day's work. And it was worth it. So you see that, again, they had this belonging identity and their purpose day in and day out. Now, Jesus comes on the scene, and he casts a new vision for them. He says to them in their place, in their identity, in their belonging, with their purpose, he's saying, wait a minute, I want to give you a new identity. I'm going to invite you into a new sense of belonging, and I'm going to give you a new purpose. So for identity... Instead of being fishermen, you say, hey, come follow me. Be a disciple of mine. I'm going to teach you, and you will be fishers of men. Fish, sure, there's a purpose in catching fish, provide for family. But catching people, reaching out, finding people in the midst of their despair, and bringing them into light and love, man, that's a whole new sense of purpose. So Jesus meets them and invites them into this process. And what do we see? Well, we see that in verse 20, we see Peter and Andrew, after the calling, it says, at once they left their nets and followed him. And then just down in that, that's the second little, little uh, note in verse 22, we see that after Jesus calls James and John, we see immediately they left their boat and their father and they followed him. At once, immediately. It was as if these guys knew we were letting go of one identity, letting go of one sense of belonging, letting go of one uh, other purpose in order to embrace something new. Now, what's important here is to note that in the ancient world, when we think about uh, the development of sort of a rabbi, teacher, student, relationship that would really find its heyday after the fall of the temple in 70 AD that what we see Jesus doing almost served as a bit of a precursor to. But we see that in this relationship, uh, disciples followed a teacher 
not just, just to learn what that, that teacher knew and understood. You see, Kimberly teaches kindergartners right now. As she, and, and so she teaches them to try to get them to know something, maybe how to tie their shoes, how to write their letters and their numbers. You know, my wife, Lindsay, is a high school teacher, and she teaches, and she has students that are trying to learn geography, earth sciences, right? There's knowledge. There's uh, kind of facts about the world that they are trying to hand off to their students. But in this world, it was less about what they knew and more about who they were. A disciple tried to be like their teacher, like their rabbi. This is fascinating because, friends, we need to understand that this is far less about simply learning and far more about trying to become. So they would passionately watch everything the rabbi did. They listened to everything that the teacher said. They would end up talking about it, debating, dialoguing. What did he mean by that? They sought in following this teacher to never to be like him. So seeing where he went, listening to what he said, watching how he interacted, where did he go, all of it. They took it all in and tried to embody it in themselves. This decision to follow meant total commitment. We saw that, right, as they let go of their identity, let go of their belonging, uh, left their father, left their nets, left their means of making an income in order to take on a new identity of trying to be like the teacher. Trying to take on his way of life. Trying to grasp his understanding of scripture. Trying to embody and become all that the teacher was. Now, friends, in this, you had the decisions of the, the, the students to become disciples and to follow. But you also had the rabbi, the teachers, looking at prospective students and determining their potential to become like the teacher. So in Jesus, seeing Peter and Andrew and James and John, mere fishermen, and him saying, hey, let go of your nets and come follow me. He's saying to them, you have what it takes to be like me. You have what it takes to take on my way in the world. You have what it takes to live out my understanding of scripture. You have what it takes to come with me. It's an affirmation. Now, friends, when we think about the process of us sitting here in 2022 and understanding that we too have been invited to walk in Jesus' way, to take on his way of life for ourselves. Friends, through the power of the Holy Spirit, there is an affirmation of each of us. That of each of us, there's an affirmation of who you are and who Jesus sees you have the potential to become. That in you, Jesus uh, can instruct you. That Jesus can empower you. And that Jesus can fill you with his spirit in order to be like him. In order to be like him. And then we see that in that this ancient world when a teacher had disciples and they had grown and developed enough we saw that the, the teachers would then send the disciples out as disciple makers. And then the teachers would say, hey, take my understanding of scripture. Take my way of life. Take my way of walking in the world and bring others into that. Make more disciples. And as you make disciples like you, because you're like me, they will also be like me. And so the idea here is that as friends, as we, Become like Jesus. We get to invite people into a process. And we influence them by how we are and how we love and how we forgive and how we navigate the various complexities of the world. Are we showing people what Jesus is like? That's the invitation to be his disciples, to be like him in the world, and then to influence others to also 
follow Jesus. This is what Jesus started when he invited Peter and Andrew and James and John and then the other disciples. And he had his 12 closest followers. And we know there were others that would follow along with them and they would learn. And we see that in the early church, it was built on the backs of just handfuls of people to explode into a movement. Friends, what is going to be happening in 2022 is so dependent upon uh, are we trying to follow Jesus or are we going to just simply follow our own way in the world? We truly have the potential to adjust what's going on in this world through the power of the Holy Spirit by simply leaning in, following closely, and trying to be like Jesus. Friends, uh, back in the 1100s, there was a dude named Richard of Chichester. And there's a, a prayer of his that has kind of come down to us. And uh, it's a prayer that I'm praying for myself for 2022. And I want to invite you all to adopt this prayer. So he says this. He says, O most merciful Redeemer, friend and brother, may I know thee more clearly. Love thee more dearly, and follow thee more nearly. Amen. May I know thee more clearly, love thee more dearly, and follow thee more nearly. Now, friends, when we think about this idea of knowing Jesus as a merciful Redeemer, well, friends, you learn that on the way. You learn that by following. You learn that by being close to the teacher, to the rabbi. And you say, John, how do I do that in 2022? Jesus isn't there physically in front of me. I can't walk along behind him on the road. Well, friends, we have his teachings. And we have uh, descriptions of where he went and what he did. And so part of being a disciple today is reading, knowing, understanding who Jesus was. Jesus of Nazareth. Not the white creation Jesus that we've made so all too often. It's Jesus of Nazareth, a faithful Jewish boy who sought to follow God, who introduced the inbreaking of God's kingdom into the world, who went to the cross for humanity, who died and was resurrected. This Jesus we get to follow. This Jesus gets to define our lives if we allow him to. Most merciful redeemer, friend, and brother. Our denomination is the Evangelical Society of Friends Eastern Region. And there's this uh, idea founded uh, in the book of John that Jesus calls his disciples' friends. This idea that we can be friends of God. And it's communicated in this prayer. This isn't a new idea. This is rooted in the history, all the way back, obviously, to Jesus introducing this concept with his followers. You, however you feel about yourself right now, as you look in the mirror, as you think about the hardships you have, as you think about maybe the loneliness you're feeling, are a friend of God. Now, when you think about friendship, the idea of, of uh, not hearing from a friend or not texting a friend or not maybe being invited to hang out with a friend. You talk about friendship as a two-way street, right? You know that with you know, any friend. Maybe there's friends now that you haven't had contact with for a little while. And maybe you're thinking, well, they haven't called me. Well, they haven't texted me. Well, I saw on Instagram that they hung out with these other people, but they didn't invite me to hang out. Friends, again, friendship is a two-way street. Have you called them? Have you texted them? Have you been there for them? When we think about friendship with God, well, God is always present. God is always there for us, waiting for that interaction. The question is, will we respond to him? Again, that two-way street of friendship. A merciful redeemer, friend, and brother. This idea of being that familial brotherhood with the risen Christ, King of Kings. There's a uh, sense of inheritance and royalty and just positional 
uh, affirmation in this. You matter. You are valuable in relation to this one, this Christ. And it's because of his mercy and his action in redeeming us. Okay, so, O merciful Redeemer, friend, and brother, may I know thee more clearly. Through COVID, uh, I've, I've talked, talked in the past about how I've experienced a bit of a fog at times. I've experienced a bit of a fog. So as we move into this new year, part of my prayer is that the fog would be released and all that I would see is Jesus. That I would know him more clearly. And that it is in that following that I see, that I can learn to trust that I would know him more clearly. Friends, as we move into this year again, I don't know how you're feeling, but as you come to know Jesus, there's some portrayals of Jesus in, popular, in the popular world and even in, you know, across the evangelical world that portray Jesus in certain ways, and yet he himself takes the words of the prophet Isaiah. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snap. You think of a bruised reed on the side of a pond, slumped over. Right? A bruised reed that has felt the weight of simply being alive. And it's too much to handle and it's slumped over. Some of us are feeling like a bruised reed, slumped over. You think of a smoldering wick. A candle that has just recently been out with all the smoke rising. All smoke, no flame. But Jesus is the one who will not break that bruised reed and will not snuff out that smoldering wick. For some of us, simply survival is the goal of 2022. And as we follow him, as we seek to know Jesus more clearly, friends, maybe grasp this picture. The one who loves, the one who supports, the one who cares. In a world of misinformation, knowing Jesus of Nazareth is important. This year, friends, will you join me in seeking after this knowledge of Christ, this clarity around who Jesus is and who he's inviting us to be as we try to follow. The next line of that prayer, may we love thee more dearly. Now in following Jesus, right, and as we come to know him, more clearly, we will see and experience how he loves the world, right? As you read, as you enter into the following through the study of the scriptures and the study of the life of Christ, and we see his, his, his teaching, and we see, man, we're going to feel some of those emotions as he's arrested, as he's tried, as we see in the pages of the text, Jesus, the one that we know more clearly, get beaten and spit on and crucified. We'll see also his resurrection. But in following, we'll feel the emotions and we will see a clear picture of love. A clear picture of love. And then as we seek to love Jesus well, we'll come to understand that part of that is involved in loving others. We love Jesus by loving his body, his church, his bride. So we love Jesus through loving others. And friends, in a world of polarization, I gotta tell you, in 2022, a love that cuts through the chaos will truly stand out. It's not about being clever, Right? It's not about me standing up here and being entertaining or having our worship team blow your socks off. It's not about providing strength and power. No, friends, it's about loving. This true love that's embodied in the person of Jesus Christ that we get to know more and more as we pursue him and follow him and get to know him more clearly. We see what love is like. And I'll tell you right now that I think that love, love like Jesus will challenge all of your assumptions. Loving like Jesus 
brings us into difficult waters, into uncomfortable places, places that we don't always love. But it's love that moves us through those. O oh, most merciful Redeemer, friend and brother, may I know thee more clearly, love thee more dearly, and follow thee more nearly. The invitation was to follow. That's what Jesus issued to Peter and Andrew and James and John. It was to follow. And this invitation involved total commitment, right? It was dropping their nets. It was leaving their place of belonging. It was shifting their focus of identity. It was adjusting their purpose, taking on a new purpose. It involved total commitment, total commitment to Jesus and his way of life in the world. For some of us, this is a challenge. The idea of total commitment to Jesus is something that we struggle with. Can't we just have a little bit of Jesus Sunday morning? Well, actually, when Jesus invites, he invites us fully. He invites us fully. His way of life, though, is beautiful and good. It's participating in something far grander than we can ever devise for ourselves. Right? You think of the shift between Peter, Andrew, James, and John fishing for smelly animals. Slimy, scaly, the source of food. To the idea of reaching out and meeting people in their brokenness and helping them experience life and love. It's a purpose that explodes, right? It explodes out from how they understood themselves in the world to give them a new vision of what's possible. And it's the same for us. What we set about day by day, again, in totally committing to follow Jesus, places the idea of sharing his life and love as the foundational thing that comes to define who we are defines our purpose, defines our why we get up in the morning. We see as Jesus led these disciples, he spoke of hardship. He spoke of difficulties. He himself was arrested. He himself died a criminal's death on a cross. He was the one who told his followers to take up their cross and to follow him. Lines like that in 2022 have sometimes almost just become uh, rote. It is what we've heard it time and again. We miss the uh, compelling disruption of these words. They've left everything, their means of income, their sense of identity, their families, in order to follow this one who said, you're going to die on a criminal's cross. Take up your cross and follow me. Following me means letting go of your own uh, selfish freedoms in order for self-sacrificial love to come to the forefront. May we follow him more nearly. Jesus invited disciples. And then we see as that movement gathered steam and the disciples took on a sense of who Jesus was, we see some of Jesus' final words in Matthew 28. He said in verse 18, you follow all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Friends, rem remember that in first century, when a disciple what grew and developed to the place where they had what it took to take on the rabbi's way, the teacher's way in the world, the teacher would send them out to be disciple makers. Well, here in Matthew 28, we see Jesus sending out his followers to make disciples of all nations. And it's in that line of disciple making that we find ourselves. Each of us is on a discipleship journey. We've been invited to walk in step with Jesus and become so like him 
that others would be influenced and join his way in the world. Now, friends, in 2022, may we be able to embrace this prayer as a prayer that's uh, a heartfelt pursuit of Christ. O merciful Redeemer, friend, and brother, may I know thee more clearly, love thee more dearly, and follow thee more nearly. Amen. And in doing so, our, may our commitment to follow Jesus cause other people to look at us and see our way in the world and say, wow, there goes a little Christ. There goes a Christian. Allow this word to be one, rather than a self-identification, becomes one that other people see. And because of a clear understanding, a knowledge of who Jesus was, and a desire to love Jesus dearly, and to follow him nearly, people say, wow, there goes some little Jesus, little Christ." in the world. And man, that stands out. Stands out. Friends, that provides a whole new sense of belonging, a whole new sense of identity, and provides for us a purpose that will drive us through 2022 and beyond. Friends, will you join me in this pursuit of Christ this year? Join me as we continue re, uh, rededicating and recommitting and rethinking about what it means to follow Jesus. Now, and always. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you have been pursuing humanity. That you have invited even us to follow Jesus. Because you see in us the potential to be like him. Not through our own power, but through listening to the instructions. To be watching who Jesus was. To be filled with the Spirit and empowered to be like Jesus in the world. And I pray that in 2022, we would experience even just a little bit more of this as we pursue Jesus with more of ourselves, understanding that the invitation is one to total commitment. May we be willing to drop our nets. May we be willing to leave our families. Sometimes that means literally, sometimes that's metaphorically, in order to fully follow Jesus in the world. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.